This is Pastor Bob Yandian. Have you ever thought you're just an ordinary, average believer going to work, coming to church, never really making an impact to the kingdom of God? We're going to talk about an ordinary believer in the Word of God, Ananias, that actually helped Saul become the Apostle Paul, an ordinary believer that was used for greatness. Join me. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Great to have you here today. I've been in the ministry now for almost, or a little over 40 years, maybe 42, 43. Of course, it all depends on the date this thing is aired. But I've been in the ministry for a long time. And something I discovered as, as I was growing up, I was just always thankful for somebody that was there to help me because I was one of those, if you, you have to be a pastor to understand this, and that is there's those people in the congregation that they come at you after every single service. I remember this one guy had a stack of books under one arm and he had his, you know, his, his note-taking stuff on the other arm and a Bible there and all that. He'd come up after every service and just ask questions and questions and questions. And there's times I'd see him coming down the aisle at me and I'd think, oh, where's the way of escape out of here? I, you know, I don't, I'll be stuck with all these. And the questions were good, but they were just so... I, part of the expression, they were just so elementary. And so I didn't know what to do when I saw him coming. And one day as he was coming at me, I thought, oh Lord, here he comes again. And the Lord spoke to me and said, Bob, that was you 20 years ago. You were filled with questions, you bugged people, but that's because you had a call on your life. And I begin to see that. Those are usually the people that have a call on their life and they just don't know exactly what to do with it. They're filled with questions, they hang around the church, they come early, they stay late, they volunteer for everything. Even though they're doing four or five things, they just keep on. And to me, what happened was I had to start listening to these people and I began to find out some of them really had something good to say. It didn't take being 20, 25, 30 years in the ministry to come up with all these answers. Sometimes if you just open up your ears, people around you will tell you things, but you have to be able. And on top of that, you have to be willing to listen to somebody that almost in your natural mind seems they're just getting started. I'm way up here. And you got, you got to get rid of that attitude. And that's why I like the book of Acts. The book of Acts is filled with ordinary people. The book of Acts isn't just the works of Paul and Peter, but of the believers in the church and how they went out in the streets and they won souls, how that they laid hands on the sick and they would recover, how that, uh, again, they would preach the word of God and signs and wonders would follow them. And that's the closing of the book of Mark, the closing of the book of Matthew. When he gave the great commission, they went into all the world, spread the gospel. They laid hands on the sick, saw them recover. They taught the word of God. And so it comes back to it. You don't have to have a pastor's name uh, attached to you or a prophet or whatever to simply do the works of God or to even offer advice that can be taken from people around you. When I took the church, I was the third pastor of our church. The first was there for five years, went from there into uh, into missions work. The second was there for about a year and a half. And I'm just, I'm firmly convinced he was there called by God, but to hold it together till Loretta and I could come along. We were the ones mainly called that would to, to take that church to the, to the level that God wanted it to go to. Not bragging on us, it was just the fact we had a knowing inside of us. And so anyway, I was the third one to come along. And so my first one was I really wanted to teach the people the important of church attendance and just being there, faithfully being there. And so I began, I began to teach it because I grew up going to church every Sunday. There was no way out of it. Every Sunday, every Sunday night, every midweek night, and every time we had any kind of special meetings at the church, our whole family was there the entire week or two weeks that those meetings were going on. I literally was raised in church and I think my mom told me basically I cut my teeth on the church pews. That's how uh, young I was going to church. So anyway, when we, when I took over the church, began pastoring, there was a man that came to me. I'd been teaching for about three or four weeks on the importance of faithful church attendance as a, as a guide for your life. And this man came to me and said, I have a question for you. I said, what's that? He said, you're the third pastor of this church. He said, the first one was here for five years. The next one was here for a year and a half. He said, you've now come along. And he said, I want you to understand, I was here through the five years of the first one. I was here through the year and a half of the second one. He says, I'm now here for you. He said, I wanna ask you a question. Does faithfulness to come to church and faithfulness to stay in church begin with me or you? How long are you going to be here? 
I suddenly was frozen in my tracks. I hadn't thought of that. I was looking to them for faithful church attendance, yet many of them had been there through the first, the second pastor. Now here I was, and I'm preaching to them to be faithful to church. And I said, you know what, sir? You're absolutely right. The next Sunday I got up before I even got into my sermon, I said, I want you to know something. I plan on being here, and Loretta, I plan on being here for the rest of our lives. I said, my my greatest thing would be to die in the pulpit. Now, a, um, <laughs> a doctor came to me later and told me all the dangers of that, dying in the pulpit. But anyway, I said, that's what my goal would be. And then I said, my associate pastor come up and finish the sermon. I said, that would be, you know, and I said, but I promise you, I'm going to be here. I'm not planning on leaving this church. I plan on marrying your children. I plan on uh, burying many of you. I plan on marrying or dedicating your grandchildren to the Lord. And it was almost like a sigh of relief came over the people. Huh. And I feel, you know what, if I had not been open to that man, just to look at him as, oh, you're just a congregational member. He came up and said something that really helped the foundation of my ministry. There was a man uh, that was let down through the roof. And I was teaching on this one night and, another, and a man came up to me out of the congregation and said, have you ever thought about this? He said, that man that Jesus said, said, sir, your sons, your sins are forgiven you. And then he healed him. He said, do you ever think about this? Perhaps that man couldn't forgive himself. And I thought, well, that's interesting. He says, because, and he, he told how the story was. He said, sir, he said, your sins are forgiven you. And then the man was healed. He said, perhaps there was something in his own life. I said, well, it'd have to be in the perfect tense that your sins have been forgiven ever since you asked me. And so I said, I'll go look it up. You know what? I looked it up and he was right. He was right. It was in the perfect tense in the Greek. Jesus has said, sir, your sins have been forgiven ever since you asked me to forgive you. And this man, it must've gone, through him, he must have thought, oh my goodness, here I am asking and asking, but I can't forgive myself. And suddenly he forgave himself and his healing came. So again, just to be able to listen to people around you, at, at Rama Bible Training Center, I was one of four teachers that were there. There were some ones that came part-time, but and they came from time to time. But there were four major teachers that were there. And uh, so one time we were teaching something and Brother Hagen called us all in, all four of us, and sat us down and said, what are you guys teaching? So I want to know. And listen, he was open to us. It wasn't the fact he said, no, I don't believe that. He listened to what we had to say. He said, I see that. He said, but let me bring this back around. He began to bring some things around. And what he taught us was teach it in moderation or teach it uh, in a way that the people can see you're not coming from one strong viewpoint or another. He said, this is one of those things that's not a heaven or hell issue. And we said, thank you. But we, again, were grateful to the fact that Brother Hagin would sit and talk with us as the teachers. It comes back to this, the book of Acts is there for a reason. It's not named after anybody. It's not named after Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It's not named after the Roman church or whatever. No, it's just called the Acts of the Apostles. And the Apostles, in fact, actually the book of Acts could better be, it would be just the Acts of Believers, those who were born again, spirit-filled, and they begin to go out and do the work of the ministry. So today, I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter we're going to take a look at what I would call an ordinary believer. You hear about him this one time, and he made such an impact on Paul that Paul mentioned him two or three other times in there, but this man was used by God to help Paul, and basically Ananias was just an ordinary believer. He loved Jesus. He accepted him as Lord and Savior, but to, for us to understand, he sets down a precedent that God can use anybody. We have to be open. On, on top of that, we have to not be so prejudiced as to think that God has to send some Mr. Super Duper, Miss Super Duper to us, the one who operates and gifts signs, wonders, and all that to give us a word because we won't accept a word from anybody else. So who was Ananias? Acts chapter 9 says this in verses 10 through 18, and I'm not going to quote all of them, but this is where the passage on him is found, and we're going to start taking up other verses out of that, but I'm not going to start with that. I'm just going to start with this verse. There was a certain disciple at Damascus, named Ananias. To him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, he said, behold, I am here, Lord. The name Ananias means protected by the Lord. He was not in the pulpit ministry. He was just a disciple in the church. In fact, the fact that his name was given here, I think is even interesting because you know what? God could have just left his name out and talked about Mr. Ordinary, Mr. Uh, the, the man that just came into, and, and God used to minister to, to Saul when Saul now accepted the Lord as Savior. The name Ananias, 
Ananias, again, means protected by the Lord. He was not in a pulpit ministry. Again, he was a disciple. He might've had some, maybe he taught a class or something in the church, but this is all it was. But we're not told anything about him. But to be honest with you, there's no such thing as a part-time minister. You know, I've heard people talk about, well, you're in the full-time ministry. Well, that, then that must mean you're in the part-time ministry. I can't find whether Christian life is a part-time ministry. Everybody has a full-time ministry. You say, yeah, but I'm a dentist. And that's my ministry. The answer is yes. If God puts you there, you use your dentist ministry to lay hands on people, to minister to them and see them saved, all those different things. I started out in a grocery store. My first job was there. And as I ministered the, and as I was in that grocery store, there was times I didn't think about it. I was ministering because I was raised in church. My life reflected that. I just lived like I thought I was supposed to. And I wasn't comparing myself to other people until one day I lost my temper. Some lady came through the checkout line. I mean, and she wanted her groceries all placed a certain way. And I lost my temper. By the time I got back, I was visibly shaken by the attitude of that woman toward me. And I'd never been treated like that by anybody before. And the girl behind the cash register looked at me and said, I've never seen you act like this. She said, I've never even seen you lose your temper. Wow. And it suddenly struck me, my life was a ministry. I'm not a part-time ministry. I'm a minister. I'm a full-time minister. You are a full-time minister. There's no such thing as a part-time minister. The moment you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, you are in the full-time ministry as much as evangelists that go around the world because that's their calling. Your calling is to stay by the stuff. And you know what David said, speaking from the Lord, he said, those who stay by the stuff will be rewarded equally with those who go into battle. So God simply saying we all share in this thing equally. That's why I like my partners. You share in the ministry with me and you stay by the stuff. You go to work every day. Your students somewhere, maybe at a college somewhere, or, or, or you know, you work in all different from blue collar to white collar to, you know, you stand in some factory line somewhere. You might work in a Walmart. It doesn't matter where you work. You're in the ministry and you're going to get people saved. And God's not going to reward uh, Billy Graham for winning somebody in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And, and all the time you're in some small town and working in a Walmart and you get somebody saved in the back room somewhere. The salvation is the same. God doesn't see it as he's a great minister. You're a part-time minister. Uh, Mrs. So-and-so, she's got a full-time ministry. You've got a part-time ministry. We all enter the full-time ministry the moment we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He was a church member. Ananias was a worker who was used by the Lord and ended up pointing Saul in the right direction. I'm quite certain it says in this verse of scripture that Ananias is called a certain disciple. The word certain is used throughout the book of Acts to point to certain people or to people and not just the, the word certain thrown in there. No, it means this person was a very important key person in the book. And certain ones are called certain ones. I keep using that word over again. But Ananias was called a certain disciple. Why? Because he was such a key and pivotal point in the life of Saul that when Saul got born again and on the road to Damascus, became later on the apostle Paul. He's called a certain disciple because he's gonna be used to direct one of God's most important ministers found in the word of God. And in Acts chapter 22, verses 12 and 13, even Paul reflected back on Ananias being used. And I'm not sure Paul ever saw Ananias after that. We don't know what happened to Ananias after that, but we will find out when we get to heaven. We're gonna talk about this when we come back from the break. Again, what I'm offering is my book on the book of Acts. And listen, it is filled with ordinary believers just like you and just like me. See you right after the break. At the dawn of the church age, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit and power to his followers. From Pentecost, they were led by his spirit to blaze a trail through the hazardous maze of pagan cultures and religious legalism. Like wildfire, the gospel spread through the known world, bringing salvation to a whole generation and triumph and trial to the church. In a New Testament commentary on Acts, Bob Yannian explores the exploits of those sent to uproot the binding vines of religion and philosophy and to sow the kingdom of God. Through evaluations of early congregations and detailed descriptions of their cities, Pastor Bob walks us through the exciting, perilous adventure of the early church. Order a New Testament commentary on Acts at bobyendian.com. I've been waiting on this book. Theology Simplified. This is a class I teach at Karis Bible College. And I've been waiting to put this into a book. It's eight different theological terms that sound difficult 
but actually are very simple. I just simply think the Bible sometimes is filled with complicated sounding words, but you break it down, it becomes very simple. This book is called Theology Simplified. Let me tell you what all it covers. It covers predestination. It covers reconciliation and sanctification. It covers glorification, justification. Redemption, propitiation, and election are all covered in this book. And again, big words with simple meanings. I bring it down to you. Go to my website, bobtheandian.com. You'll find how you can have a copy for yourself. Blessings upon blessings to you. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. You know, in the Old Testament, in the book of Joel, Joel gave a prophecy of the days when the church would begin and called it the last days. It shall come to pass in the last days, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. He's simply saying there, there's no difference between young men and young women. He went on to point out old men and young men. He said, old men uh, shall have dreams, young men will have visions. And he pointed out the difference. But he's simply saying, God will be no respecter of persons. And on your handmaidens, that's 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 people that work in your house. Handmaidens were, were those that worked around the table and those that opened the door and those, again, that cleaned the house, all that kind of stuff. He went on to say there, the same thing was true there. In other words, God sees no difference in any believer. He would point his spirit upon all flesh. How did Ananias know to go and find Saul? It's because he received a vision. And in that vision, he was told what to do. And Ananias understood grace. He laid hands on Saul and kept it a secret. We're going to find that out. But again, Ananias because he was used to direct one of God's most important ministers was simply called here in this verse of scripture, Acts chapter 22, verses 12 and 13. And here in chapter nine of the book of Acts, we find out again that he was used by God for this particular reason. Why? Because he's nobody special. In fact, again, we come back to it. Is he anybody special? I guess we could say, because we're all special in the eyes of God. But he did not stand back and say, well, Lord, I don't deserve to do this. Perhaps maybe the pastor of the church or Peter or, or John or one of those that were there on the day of Pentecost were one of Jesus' disciples. They would be more qualified to do this. And God just simply said no. So again, he was a church member. He was a worker who was used by the Lord to point Saul in the right direction. And like any spirit-filled believer, Ananias received a vision and then was obedient to it. But you know what? This is what was prophesied by Joel, quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost. It'll come to pass in the last days. I'll pour it in my spirit upon all flesh. Maybe Ananias was standing there. Maybe Ananias was part of the 120 that had been in the upper room. We don't know about him till chapter nine. When God finally gives a vision to him of a man named Saul and said, you're going to lay hands on him. And so again, like any spirit-filled believer, Ananias received a vision and was obedient. That tells us something here that Ananias must have been young because said, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. I haven't got to the dream part yet, but I certainly have left the vision part. I've never had a vision, but you know what? I'm looking forward to God showing me some dreams in the days to come. But Ananias received a vision, just like Peter received one on the housetop later on, and just like, again, others in throughout the book of Acts, it's because these are ordinary believers. Ananias received a vision, then he was obedient to it. Ananias also understood grace. He laid hands on Saul and then kept it a secret. Most probably would have been so proud of their role in laying hands on such an important man, they would run and tell everybody, but Ananias didn't tell anybody because he was asked by God not to tell anybody and he simply kept his word. What was the problem? Whenever God spoke to him, man, he wrestled with that for a moment because why? Saul was known by everybody. God wanted Saul to learn early the power of anyone who is dedicated to the Lord. So he started out that the moment he was saved, that he was helped by this man named Ananias and didn't know it on top of that. He couldn't even see him because he'd been struck blind for some time and couldn't see this man in front of his face. But later on gave great recommendation to him, great, gave a great testimony of him about how this man that probably again Saul never saw after that date 
helped him and would see, he would see him one day in, his, in heaven. In his arrogance, Saul might have expected a minister from the local church like Peter or John or one of the original disciples to come and lay hands on him. And that's not what God did. God wanted to introduce early into Saul's ministry. I'm going to use you to affect the common man, to get common people saved. In fact, you're not even going to minister to Jews. You're going to minister to Gentiles. You're not going to minister to kings and those in high positions. You're just going to see people off the street healed and set free because because God is no respecter of persons. You ought to be glad God is no respecter of persons. That God just doesn't care for the Oral Roberts of this life and the Billy Grahams of this life and those that have churches of 10,000 or more. God's interested in those that have a position in a church working back there with children or else you have a ministry where you go to work every day and you've been able to lead two or three people in that place to the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for people, see their needs change, their lives changed in, and again, help set them free. This is what God's called. He's called all of us to spread everywhere. He's called for uh, people that are bosses to minister to bosses and associates to minister to associates all the way down the list. He's called plumbers to witness to other plumbers. And that's why, again, one person, the pastor or somebody in the church can't minister to everybody, but we minister to who God sends us across their path. And you know what? God sends us into all levels of society. And that's what the book of Acts is all about. People being born again in the church and then going into all levels of society and ministering to those around them because this is the person you can't stop. You know what? In different countries, Amer Americans have gone to become uh, evangelists and become uh, ministers over there and to go and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I do know of one man. He became a missionary. But when he got to a certain country, he'd only been there for a while and they kicked him out. He said, Bob, how can God call you to be a missionary, but you go in there and you can't do anything? I said, think about this for just a moment. How many people did you see get saved? He said, well, I had about 30 or 40 people get saved. He said, did you start a church? Yeah, we started. It's just getting off the ground. He said, well, think about that. God started that. And then you've been pulled out of the way, but they can't kick a person out that belongs there. They can kick you out because they can make laws against other people from other countries, but they can't do that with their own people. Can you see the wisdom of God. Paul went into places and won people by the thousands, but then he set up churches there and he left. Why? Because, oh yeah, they could come against him as a Roman coming into this city, as a Jew coming into this city, but you can't get rid of the people that are there and understand something. Ananias was one of those entrenched because he was a person right there out of that area and right out of the church. So a man's position and power before he is born again is of no value to God. So quit bragging about who you were before you got born again. I mean, I'm, I've heard times times when moms would tell their kids, I was a singer. I was a backup singer for so-and-so. And I was, you know, I did music things everywhere and all that. And then I got saved and they'll talk about how that, oh, I must be important to God because he took me out of such an important place. You were of no value. Understand something. You had no higher value than Paul. Paul said, I was the chief of sinners. He said, man, when they wanted an interview, they came to me. When the Jerusalem Post wanted to know what was going on in the Jewish religion, they came to me. I was known everywhere. My picture was on magazines. My picture was in the newspaper. Everywhere you look, you see pictures of Saul, Saul, Saul. You know what Saul said? He said, I was nothing. He said, I was less than nothing. He said, I became born again. He says, listen to this. I was the highest in position in the world. I got born again and became less than the least of all saints. And I took a step up. In other words, you could be president of a country and not be born again, and then no longer be president of that country, receive Jesus as Savior, and you just took a step up. It was said of Billy Graham years ago. Someone said, have you ever thought about running for president of the United States? And you know what he said? I wouldn't step down. What an incredible statement. I wouldn't step down. He saw that he was in the highest position he could have. And let me tell you this, if you're a deacon in the church, if you're an elder in the church, if you have a class in the church, God is simply wanting you to come back to it. The ordinary believer with God is not ordinary. Ordinary is a word that other people use, but God doesn't use that. He says of all of us, we are all the righteousness of God. We have all obtained salvation. We're all gonna go to heaven and rewards in heaven are not determined by what kind of position you had, what kind of title you had, it's simply were you faithful to do what God called you to do. He's not going to say to you, well done, good and qualified servant. He's not going to say to you, oh, you tremendous man that won 10,000. Lord, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Were you faithful over your 200? Or in, just as this man was faithful over his 10,000, were you faithful each work day to go to work and to talk about Jesus and whenever the needs came up, pray for people? It, did you do that? Then you were faithful to God. You might consider yourself to be an ordinary believer, but wait until you get to heaven when you see the shouts and rejoicings up there. My dad used to tell me a story 
that there was a man that was a, a missionary and he was sent to Africa and he went over there and it kept expecting every year he was going to get to go back, but all kinds of things happened, disease and attacks as he was in these villages and stuff. It ended up later, his wife was killed and his kids were killed. And toward the end of his life, he had no one. So he decided he would go back to the United States and those that support him said him just enough to where he could come back to the United States. And he got on a ship and he was coming back and didn't know it, but President Teddy Roosevelt was on that same ship, had been over in Africa shooting wild game and was on that boat. He said, I didn't know it. And he talked about it later. He says, in fact, it wasn't until we were just about off the ship that I found out he was there. He said, they blocked everybody. Nobody was allowed off the ship until the president left the ship. He says, I saw him walk down the gangplank. I saw all these workers in front of him, secret service in front, all the workers back. They took him on down. He got into a, a, he got into a convertible car, was driving down the streets of New York and said there was a ticker tape parade as he came back. And he said he watched that go and he sat there and he stood there on the edge. He said, I watched all the other people get off the ship. He said, there was no one there to meet me. No one. He said, I began to cry and said, Lord, I have been in Africa for years. I have gone and ministered in those little tiny villages. My wife was killed over there in the work of the ministry. My children were killed over there in the work of ministry. And now I'm an old man. And I come home and there's no one here to meet me. And he said, the Lord spoke to him and said, what makes you think you've come home? You haven't come home yet. Wait till you see what you have when you come to heaven. You think there's ordinary believers? Oh, people think it down here, but there's no such word as ordinary. When Bob comes into heaven and you come into heaven, there's not gonna be something up there that says special Bob and non-special Bill, whoever you are. No, no, it's none of that. You see, because with God, we are all in God's sight, very important. So a man's position and power before he is born again is of no value to the Lord. It used to amaze me as I'd read the stories in the Old Testament of the children of Israel bragging to their children how great the food was back there. Oh, we had this leeks and we had garlics and we had all these other stuff and now all we have is this bread out here. Oh, they didn't tell about being beaten. They didn't tell about the dying. They didn't tell about making bricks without straw. They didn't talk about the fact that they were in slavery for 400 years. Oh, they didn't bring that up. They'd bring out these little things of how great. And listen to me, let me tell you what, before you were born again, you were in slavery to Satan. Oh, you might have had some recognition here and some recognition there, but Satan gives no recognition without looking for something in return. God doesn't care about what he gets in returns. He just wants to pour out his blessing and his grace on you. God will spend much time in eternity sweating out the background and pride of Saul of Tarsus as as he did with Moses or he does with anyone. It comes back to this. Whenever Saul gave his life to the Lord, it took a long time in the backside of the wilderness before God could release him to go ministry. Why? Because God had to get Saul out of Saul, this pride out of him. What's the second? It, Saul went to the same place Moses did. Saul is the second graduate of the wilderness and Moses was the first one. And Moses came out of that wilderness. You know what? It took 40 years for God to sweat Moses out of Moses and Moses who was arrogant after 40 years ended up saying, I don't think I can say anything. I don't even know what to do. I don't think I can even talk anymore. And God said, that's what I'm looking for. I'll have your brother talk for you and then I'll end up talking for you. And of course, once Moses got there and saw the call of God, he rose up with a brand new type of boldness. Thanks for watching today. We're gonna to continue this tomorrow as we talk about what is an average believer as far as God is concerned. It's you. It's me. I don't care. You can compare yourself to anybody, including Jesus Christ. And listen, none of us are average for what God wants us to do. So I'll see you tomorrow. And also don't forget that book on Acts that I'm offering and you'll be blessed by it. See you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.